Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Thrilled to be back with you again. Today, we're going to look at the story of a ship, a revolutionary ship uh, that represented a new type of vessel that was the red-haired stepchild of the fleet until it would emerge as the dominant force in the fleet in the Second World War. I refer, of course, to America's first aircraft carrier, the USS Langley. This, art, this book was um, sort of previewed, if you will, in the pages of Naval History Magazine a couple years back. And now the full fruition of that work is now here with the same author. And we're pleased to welcome back a name well known in Naval Historical Circles, David F. Winkler. Dave, greetings and welcome back to you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me on. Dave's book is America's First Aircraft Carrier, USS Langley and the Dawn of U.S. Naval Aviation published by the Naval Institute Press and literally hot off the press. Uh, this is a great book. It's beautiful looking. Anybody who has an interest in the history of aircraft carriers and whatnot will want to have a copy of this because the Langley, of course, was firstest with the mostest and set the template for what would follow. So obviously, because it's the first U.S. aircraft carrier, it's worth celebrating and marking and uh, remembering. But maybe you could tell us a little bit more about sort of the significance of the Langley and the overall picture of things uh, for those who've heard of it, but maybe don't know the full story, which they'll find in this book. Thanks, Eric. Now, the Langley, uh, you know, what's surprising is that uh, it was brought to my attention a couple of years ago that nobody had ever written a book just on the Langley. Uh, there's been a lot of ship biographies, uh, you know, for example, you know, most of the aircraft carriers, like the, the Enterprise, uh, Saratoga, Lexington, uh, even, even one on, you know, the Ranger, which was a uh, CP4, the, the carrier that was the first Navy's carrier built to keel up. But uh, uh, the Langley uh, CB1, the first, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, it's referred to in a lot. Any uh, book on the history of aircraft carriers obviously mentions the Langley, but as far as a ship biography is concerned, uh, hadn't been done, and uh, uh, you know, there was one. Uh, thankfully, uh, there was a uh, covered wagon association, and with uh, veterans of the crew that was formed in 1980, and they put together a, uh, a kind of a scrapbook, uh, which was in the Navy Department Library, but uh, uh, which was very helpful because it had like questionnaires on what did you do on the line. So we have a list of perspective, but uh, nothing uh, uh, ever put in print. So uh, th that got me going about uh, oh, almost uh, 10 years ago now. And I was blessed to get a uh, fellowship from the Smithsonian, the Charles Lindbergh chair, which uh, allowed me to take a year off just to work on this and uh, uh, started working. And lately, uh, uh, I was hoping to have the book out in 2022 for the centennial, but COVID uh, you know, prevented me from having access to you know, archival sources. So it, 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 thankfully, for, uh, you know, the Naval Institute Press uh, uh, published it in 2024, two years you know, behind schedule. But yeah, Langley, uh, we're not the first to have an aircraft carrier. Uh, Brits uh, came out with it during World War One, and of course, we had a naval observers with the uh, Royal Navy during the First World War, and uh, uh, we quickly came to the uh, conclusion that we need to have uh, have one of those. Uh, and uh, back in 1918, uh, the uh, proposal went before the General Board to build six of these. But uh, at the time, uh, the uh, you know, CNO Benson said, "Hey, we can't get these out for the fleet by the end of the war. Let's let's not make the investment." Still in 1919, uh, you know, we wanted to get in the game, and the general board met, uh, met again. And uh, basically, uh, you know, they were very favorable. Uh, uh, big driver was uh, uh, Kenneth Whiting, uh, he was a commander at the time, uh, or you know, one of the pioneer naval aviators. Uh, uh, Henry Mustard, uh, you know, uh, pushed for it. And, uh, they uh, uh, they were able to get the uh, general board to, to buy into it uh, over some objections. Uh, you know, there was a uh, uh, 
Captain George Steele, who really advocated for bigger seaplanes. So let's just keep making them bigger and bigger. And, uh, you know, Mustin said, you know, that, uh, you know, the seaplanes are kind of a fair weather proposition. You really, you know, you're going to need to put uh, aircraft. So, so they wound up, instead of uh, building from the key lot like they were going to propose the year before, uh, budgets were cutting down. Uh, you know, World War One's over. Uh, let's take something that maybe we're not going to use, uh, like colliers, because the fleet is, you know, converting to uh, oil uh, propulsion. Uh, let's take one of those and they start looking at some of the colliers they had built in the decade before, uh, and uh, they focused on uh, uh, the Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter was a, a collier, collier with, which was built with an electric drive for propulsion. It was an experimental plant, but you get you out to 16 knots, and uh, they uh, they decided to select the uh, Jupiter a Collier built in uh, 1912 out in uh, Mare Island uh, you know, for a conversion. So uh, it took a while. They, they said, well, we could do this in a, uh, a year. Uh, well, uh, from 1919 uh, until 1922, when the ship was commissioned in March, uh, that was more than a year, and it was... Uh, cost a little bit more money than they anticipated. In fact, the ship really wasn't ready for commissioning in March of 1922. The reason why they, they commissioned 22 was uh, they ran out of uh, Bureau of Yards construction funds. They had to go to operational uh, maintenance funds to finish off the ship. And the ship really was finished in uh, September of uh, uh, 22. And it goes out to sea and you have your first launch, uh, your first recovery in October 22. So that that's kind of the genesis of how uh, Langley comes into being. Is there any other um, thing about the Collier in specific? I mean, I, I, I understand it's sort of a, a becoming an outmoded need for a Collier. Was there anything else about a Collier that made it why it was selected for conversion besides that? Eric, that's a good question because what was beautiful about the Collier is, is that it had big voids within Okay, so uh, you had the uh, the pilot house was, uh, was up forward, uh, and what they wound up doing is they uh, built a flying deck over. You know, they t they took down all the king post and structures, and uh, they basically uh, covered over that uh, uh, in the pilot house, and, uh, so that you kind of had a limited view from the you know the bridge of the ship. You had a deck overhead, so you had to go from bridge to bridge. But the, 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 the holes were, uh, were just beautiful for dropping the aircraft in and, and uh, doing, uh, having set up workshops and storing, storing aircraft. So, uh, and the other thing which was nice about a collier is that you really didn't make, need too much of a crew uh, uh, to get the uh, uh, you know, plant operational and running. So uh, you had a relatively small uh, crew as far as to actually run the ship. You, you could dedicate the rest of the space to the uh, you know the air uh, group that was going to embark on or the squad, initially the squadrons. So, so it had other advantages as well structurally, um, and you can kind of see that when you look at a, a, a picture of it. How that sort of capacious hall was just great for what they're going to dabble in here. Yeah, it's a little different from uh, what we consider consider a modern day aircraft carrier in that you have the flight deck and then you have a hangar deck below. Uh, yeah, they built this flying deck and what they had below is kind of like a void uh, where they stowed aircraft, but pretty much you had a, uh, a lift system with like a, uh, a, a, a above you had uh, uh, dollies that would drop aircraft into the holes and pull them out, uh, out of the holes and then put them on the elevator and they would push them up on the flight deck. Uh, this was not a speedy process. And one of the things that uh, the, the Navy, our Navy, quickly comes to the conclusion is that we really, uh, let's put, you know, put all the airplanes up on the flight deck and flight, you know, load them up there uh, so that we don't have to do this you know, one airplane at a time up to the elevator and, and launch. And this is something that, you know, gives us an edge over some of the other navies, such as the Brits. Right. You read these early accounts, and I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, the centennial coverage, which included your wonderful piece on the language back in uh, the March 22 issue. 
uh, it's just like the Wild West. These guys, I mean, it's like who was the first person hungry enough to try to eat an oyster, right? Yeah. The guys flying off, taking off on um, up here and just learning the basics of how you're going to do this thing. They, um, they had some real guts. I mean, they're kind of inventing it as they go. Um, I find well, that very interesting about it as well. No kidding. And you know what was amazing is that uh, I, uh, as I'm going through the tech lots of the like now, uh, 22 through 24, those first, first years, people had gotten into the deck lots and lots of the National Archives. But when I'm going like from 1925 up, uh, through the 1930s, I'm opening deck lots for the first time. Nobody had ever looked into these things. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm finding all of these accidents, uh, planes crash, planes go over the side. Um, and what's amazing is, is that, you know, plane would crash, a uh, pilot would, uh, you know, bump his nose, uh, uh, you know, for crack a tooth, uh, perhaps uh, scratches. Plane goes over the side. Plane is recovered. Pilot is recovered. These guys are indestructible. Uh, I just, uh, I was just amazed on you know, um, plane crashes. Pilot gets out, gets the next plane, takes off. Okay, <laughs> how do you do that? Uh, but these guys, you know. Uh, uh, and, and part of it is the planes back then were, were slow, okay? So, uh, you know, their speed kills. And uh, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Bob Dunn wrote a wonderful book for the Naval Institute Press uh, in the 1950s talking about how many, you know, the, the casualty rate uh, amongst naval aviators as we transition from uh, propeller-driven aircraft to jets. It, it, it's, it's horrendous. We're in, in contrast to here, you got planes coming in at a relatively, you know, uh, you can drive uh, faster on the interstate uh, than, you know, than these planes are going in, in the 1920s. So uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, they said, well, okay, let's put a seatbelt in. That's a good idea. And, uh, uh, yeah. but that, but otherwise, um, uh, it's uh, you know these guys are pretty indestructible. There, you know, I read more fatal accidents. Unfortunately, you know, uh, a plane, uh, you know, somebody, an air crew on the deck walks into a, a propeller, for example. You know, uh, quite a few fatality, uh, you know, fatalities on the deck, and the uh, the trapping. Okay, you got these uh, these cables on the deck. Uh, sometimes. Uh, you might have a snap, and that may take out uh, some of the air crew, you know, the, the deck handlers. Uh, so uh, that's there's where your accidents really, really came. Yeah, these are the true pioneers of uh, naval aviation. Well, you mentioned some of these in your, um, in what you were saying earlier, kind of setting the origin stage for it. But um, I'm also interested on the higher level of like the the the, the uh, battle for this concept and how uh, for, for many it was like they had to be dragged kicking and screaming to it. Who were some of the key players in the story of how this actually came about and then this allowed finally to sort of develop this doctrine as they went? Yeah, I, I would think, uh, uh, that, you know, the, the naval aviation community wasn't even too sure what they wanted to do with this thing. Uh, initially, uh, they just wanted to do it. Uh, naval aviators like bus, they just wanted to this thing as an experimental aircraft carrier. The idea of making this an operational uh, platform for the Navy to, uh, uh, it, you know, everybody saw the advantages, the, the, the battle of you know, ships and captains really appreciated having airplanes out there as you know, for the purposes of spotting an enemy fleet, so you know, to provide uh, guidance as far as how to engage that fleet, and also for spotting. Okay, so that was the initial. Uh, yeah, we need to have airplanes. Everybody realized that they're they're great at spot at spotting, and uh, this is where you get airplanes uh, catapults up with cruisers and battleships at the time. You know, it's it's good to have eyes in the skies for uh, spotting. Uh, it was. Uh, yeah, uh, Joseph Mason Reeves, the real guy, uh, when uh, 
Langley gets out to the West Coast at the end of 1924. Reeves comes out there to be the uh, Air uh, Squadron's uh, battle fleet uh, commander at uh, the end of uh, 25. And he's the one who has his 1001 uh, question speech where he brings all the aviators together on the West Coast and says, okay, guys, we got something here, but until we solve these questions, uh, we ain't we ain't worth a squat for the fleet. And you know, uh, Reeves' vision is that how many airplanes you can get into the air uh, so that you don't come at the enemy battle fleet so, you know, onesies and twosies, uh, where you can make an impact is if you know do you know mass fires. Okay. So he's the one who really pushes this idea of getting lots of airplanes on the flight deck. Uh, Langley was basically designed to maybe carry a dozen aircraft, uh, you know, doing this experimental uh, phase. Uh, uh, Reeves gets it up to 42, okay, two and a half squadrons. And uh, by uh, May of 1928, uh, they're in an exercise where they go out off of Hawaii. And on like May the 17th, uh, four in the morning, they get all these planes off the flight deck, and they stage their own surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Okay, this is uh, yeah, 13 years before you know the Japanese did the same thing. So uh, Reeves is there to you know to demonstrate that uh, yeah, we're, we're yeah we can scout, we can uh, we can do uh, you know uh, gunfire support, but you know we're in, uh, you know, we can we commit offensive weapon in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um. Were there any surprises um, as that popped out for you as a result of your research? Because, like you say, you're looking through, you're pouring through old deck logs and whatnot that you might have been the first person to open that thing in many, many decades. So, uh, anything pop out in, in, during your research? Then? Well, I, yeah, I think I mentioned uh, uh, you, know, you know the fact that <laughs> these guys are pretty indestructible. Uh, no. Uh, the uh, the whole 1920s and 1930s, you had this series of uh, fleet problems, and how uh, first Langley, and, and then uh, you, uh, Lexington and Saratoga come in line, uh, in like 29 time frame, and how they're de working together to develop tactics uh, to augment the battle fleet. Uh, there, there's a, a, a uh, it's kind of interesting. I gave a talk uh, back in uh, November uh, over in Germany at the Battle of Navasso Sea in 1930, where basically they had the Saratoga and the Langley, uh, the blue forces, which were you know the U.S. side versus black forces, which was in Germany, and uh, through circumstances uh, we, we didn't we couldn't find the Lexington. Lexington was in a cloud. Lexington scouts planes found us. Uh, Saratoga and Langley get wiped off the planet. Uh, and, you know, I, I talked to the Germans and said, hey, did you, really, you know, you the German Navy won this great victory back in 1930. But it kind of uh, uh, demonstrated to uh, the potency of aircraft carriers because after Langley and Saratoga uh, are wiped out, Basically, the scouting fleet, uh, which is representing the German Navy, uh, just wipes out the uh, the Blue Fleet because they had air support and scouting, and the uh, the Blue Navy didn't. So uh, this was a wake up call, uh, you know, up in Newport, which you know the Naval War College are following these exercises very closely. So that was that was kind of an eye opening. Is back in 1930, we're, we're really re realizing. You know the potency. This is ten years before uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, and, and you know, of course, the uh, climatic battle of Midway. Right, and that touches on another uh, thing that comes out in your story. Um, the, the conventional wisdom, of course, is how uh, World War II, Pacific, was a real sort of uh, wake-up call to the value of this platform. But there were advocates early on. It's not like everybody finally was convinced. In World War II, there are people championing this, which is why they were even available by the time that war started. Um, so, these people, I guess, we can look at as the visionaries now. 
uh, Reeves proved um, how much you could max it out with what they were doing. But that to me is interesting as well. This shows that this was like an on-running thing well before uh, they really came into their own in the Pacific War. And I find that a dynamic of it as well. Yeah, no, the, uh, you know, I, I think the narrative is, is that, uh, well, you know, the, the black shoes, the battleship, uh, you know, the sailors, uh, commanders, the battleship admirals had it in for the aviators and were doing everything possible to suppress aviation. And then Pearl Harbor happens and we don't have our battleships. Uh, and I really, um, you know, kind of found throughout the, the narrative is that uh, you know, in the research is, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of support, uh, you know, for aircraft carriers amongst the battle uh, ship, uh, you know, as a weapon uh, that can go out and, and blunt the, the enemy fleet before you have that climatic juggling type, uh, uh, you know, battleship on battleship engagement. So. Uh, the fact that after Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, we, ha we have our carriers out doing raids uh, immediately, and they can become the centerpiece warship, uh, uh, you know, at uh, Coral Sea and Midway and, and, and then so on. So, yeah. Um, well, let's uh, talk about the ultimate fate of the language. She went from a sort of an experimental vessel to... Uh, being right out there in the thick of it, um, what was her final? Out, what was the final uh, final days of the Langley? Let's touch on that. Yeah, Langley, you 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 know, if you can get yourself a deep submersible, you you can go visit it today. It's off the south coast of Java. Uh, so how it got there is it, kind of interesting. Is that uh, uh, I, I I mentioned this uh, Captain Steele who argued for bigger and bigger uh, uh, patrol planes, amphibious air, aircraft. Uh, seaplanes and uh the irony is steel winds up uh, in command of the saratoga so he, he winds up in commanding an aircraft carrier and, and, and probably runs it aground and so that's the end of his career uh and then after that uh you know it had he been around a little longer you would have seen langley in 1937 uh converted to a seaplane tender uh, to service the type of airplanes that uh, Steele was advocating for, which was the uh, PBY Catalinas. Okay, uh, this was a really big, uh, uh, you know, patrol plane uh, that, uh, uh, quite frankly, they, they needed a ship the size of the Langley to to service. So uh, Langley winds up uh, uh, converted, um, ironically, uh, at Mare Island, uh, where the ship was built with the front half of the flight deck peeled off. Uh, when it comes back to San Diego, there are some folks that were looking at not were aware that language was converted. They thought it was a Japanese aircraft carrier. Uh, the, the high, uh, the, I think it was the Hydro or something. You know, uh, kind of looked like it. And, and likely there was certain things. people started calling it the Langley Maru. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the carrier you know, goes on uh, a lot, couple of expeditions up to the uh, Alaska. Uh, the it's, it's assigned to the base uh, force. You know, there's the battle fleet, there's the um, scouting fleet that, uh, or the scouting force. And the base force is kind of like, uh, and Admiral Ernest King is uh, makes it his flagship. So King is uh, embarked, and they go up to Alaska. They investigate Sitka. They're they're, they're looking at. Uh, bases. They go down to Midway French Frigates uh, Shoals and continues to participate in these fleet problems. Uh, 1939, uh, you know, Langley's involved in fleet problems in the uh, Caribbean, goes up to New York for the World's Fair, uh, and then is tensions are, uh, uh, you know, with Japan are, it, it's, uh, it's getting it's kind of tense. So what they decide to do is forward the uh, 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 you know, position Langley in Hawaii, uh, and then the Germans invade Poland. Okay, so when Germany invades Poland, Langley is in Hawaii. They say, "Okay, we're going to transfer your fast, you know, uh, deploy you out to Manila." Okay, because they realize the Europeans are not going to be able to uh, you know, reinforce, uh, you know, the Netherlands, East Indies. Uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, we need more of a presence, a scouting presence in uh, the Philippines. 
So uh, at the end of 1939, uh, Langley becomes uh, stationed in Manila, and that's where uh, Langley is when uh, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Langley escapes uh, the next day. Uh, and eventually finds uh, herself in Australia, makes it to Darwin at the New Year's, uh, and is uh, as, assist with you know ASW as far as you know scout planes are concerned. As a signed admission, you know the, the government, you know the Java, the Dutch uh, uh, colonial island, uh, Netherlands, East Indies is under stress. They need reinforcements as far as aircraft are concerned. So Langley's assigned to transport Army P of uh, P thirty uh, nine, so no P forties, Warhawks, uh, and, uh, and and what happens is on. Uh, a day out, uh, and, you know, Langley is caught, uh, you know, by a Japanese uh, aerial assault, and it, it's basically, uh, uh, you know, it sustains like five bomb hits, and uh, they evacuate the crew, and uh, we had, we had to scuttle it. Uh, this is February twenty seventh, uh, nineteen forty two, off the uh, southern coast of Java. So after all of that, she ended up going down to the deep in World War Two. That's right. Um, but she was prophetic. Um, uh, what were some of the more interesting sea stories that you stumbled across involving the lake? I, I, I think the most uh, uh, you know, comical one is we had uh, our first ace was David S. Ingalls. Okay. Uh, he was a Yale, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, students at Yale formed a, an aviation club and, uh, and they volunteered their services for the Navy and the, and the Navy took them up uh, on it and they got deployed to uh, Europe to World War One. and uh, Ingalls got cross-decked over to the Royal Air Force and uh, he managed to uh, you know, shoot down uh, you know, five German uh, aircraft uh, in the final months of the war. So he's our first, you know, celebrated as our first naval ace. Um, he gets out and uh, uh, he goes back to Yale, gets a degree in English, and he uh, uh, works himself into politics he, I guess he, in, in Ohio. Uh, and uh, eventually he gets appointed as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Aviation in the uh, administration of Uber. And as such, uh, he actually has his own airplane, so he flies around the country to uh, to visit air bases, and he goes out to the uh, uh, North Island uh, and, and lands and uh, makes an initial visit to the Langley, and then comes back in November of uh, 1930. Will Rogers, uh, of all people, the, you know, the uh, humorist, uh, who's a big fan of the Navy, and he's insisting on, um, he wants to get carrier fault. He wants to uh, make traps. And uh, so, uh, you know, he, he, he learned. So they, okay, well, we'll do this. And Reeves is kind of nervous about this. And uh, uh, the, the commanding officer of the ship was a fellow by the name of Rufus Zogbaum. Uh, Rufus Zogbaum was actually, uh, you know, the son of a famous uh, 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 illustrator in, in the late 19th century. And uh, they're worried about that, you know, what could go wrong here? And, and well, uh, they talk through it uh, and uh, how you go about doing it. And uh, Ingalls takes off. And, it, and, and before they take off, they say, you know, remember, um, drop your hook. That's the last thing you got to do before you land. And, uh, and, and, this, and Will Rogers, I bet you're going to forget you can drop your hook. And, you know, they even wager on it. And sure enough, he takes off and the plane's making its approach. And there's, it doesn't drop, he doesn't drop his hook. So he gets waved off, and uh, again, the second approach, and he doesn't drop his hook, so he gets waved off. He's getting frustrated, and he gets waved off a third time. Finally, there's this enlisted chief who scrolls on its blackboard, you know, hook, <laughs> okay? And, and, and he goes, oh, yeah, I, I got it. <laughs> and he, and you know, he makes a successful trap, and then, uh, you know, and, and, he, and then he, turn, he turns to Will Rogers and says, okay, 
you you wrote about uh, landing on an aircraft carrier. Get in the back seat. Uh, we're going to do this together now. Uh, so you know, Will Rogers, uh, you know, eventually is going to make a trap up for the likely with with Ingle. So it's uh, um, yeah, that was cool. that, that was, and then afterwards, uh, uh, you know, I had to make I had to uh, make cut some words from uh, you know for for space limits, but. You know, on, on the cutting room floor, you know, I talked about them all going to Tijuana afterwards and having a great time and, uh, and then having to sneak back uh, over the U.S. border at like at two in the morning there, there, there by, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, U.S. Customs. So uh, uh, it was a, uh, it, you know, that was, that, that was quite you know, one of the more interesting adventures with the Langley. So there is a Will Rogers connection to early naval aviation. That's Who knew? Yeah, that's uh, it's quite a revelation. Well, um, what do you think about the importance of the Langley? You know, now right in the uh, wake of its centennial, as we look back, I mean, it's such a um, landmark craft, and uh, I doubt it was realized that it would be, even by those who really were ardent champions of this concept at the time, that it would uh, be the sire, if you will, of a whole new fleet going into the little part of the 20th century. Um, what would you say is an important thing to um, honor about the language, aside from being the first, you know, blazing well, the trail? Well, the, the thing is to keep in mind is when you look at a flight deck of a modern U.S. aircraft carrier, not even a U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier, if you take a look, for example, at what the Chinese are doing, uh, you take a look at operations, you got the trap wire, uh, you got the catapult, you, and then you see the crew servicing these aircraft, and they're all in different uh, colored uniforms. You got uh, you know uh, red, white, yellow, green, you know, and they, they signify that uh, they have different jobs. That all originates from the language. As far as landing aircraft is concerned, you have a landing uh, uh, the LSO. Uh, it's the landing signals officer or safety, safety officer. Uh, it, it's uh, that all starts, you know, with the paddles is on board the uh, the Langley. Uh, so, it, you know, there's a lot of just how to go about uh, doing flight operations. Uh, everything that's done uh, uh, today, you know, it had to be tried out and perfected on board the Langley. So, uh, as far as you know, the uh, the legacy of what what's going on on flight decks today that that really goes back over a hundred years now. It's quite a legacy now, a uh, whole century. Um, having aircraft carriers in the fleet, um, and it's nice to be able to honor that. And anybody who's interested in carrier aviation definitely want to have this book in the library. And um, I think you've uh, made a great contribution to the literature. Yes, there it is, right here. I have it right here too, and uh, I commend you for that, Dave. This is a book that, as you say, uh, it's almost surprising that nobody had ever done a book singly about America's first aircraft carrier until now. And this was certainly the right time to do it. Uh, it was overdue. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, best of luck with the book. It's uh, it's a great um, effort, and it looks wonderful. It reads beautifully. Uh, I would recommend to anybody listening or watching to make sure you go out and get it. It's quite a wonder. And David F. Winkler, it's been great to chat with you again. We've got to get you in a magazine again. I think um, the Langley piece was the last time you've been in there, so uh, we should talk offline about that. Okay. Well, I got a book review that uh, I'm right now reading, so you'll see my okay. name there shortly. So That's a start. That's a start. It's Good. A start. Well, Dave Winkler, thanks for joining us. This has been great. Um, I guess that's it for us folks, another uh, Naval History Edition of the Proceedings Podcast. We'll be back again very soon with uh, more interesting content uh, reflecting the current issue. Uh, and we'll look forward to talking to you then. Until then, take care.